Now, th there are all kinds of things you can do. Um, I, I am going to tell you, I've done this. I, I've taken it, but I have pre-negotiated reductions in price. Hey, we'll list it at 154. But if we get less than three showings in the first two weeks, we're going to go to 140, 151. And then in three more weeks, we're going to go to one. You can pre-negotiate those reductions. All right. And that might be a way to say, okay, I'll take the 154 for three weeks. And then it's going to drop and eventually it's going to get into the price range. So you can do that as well. Now, if the client says, no, we'll talk about it later. Now you're back in the same boat. So there on page 172, the listing price, you are going to help them by giving them a range with your CMA. They need to ultimately be the ones that decide. Um, the broker's authority, this is the paragraph that conveys agency to us. It conveys that agency to us. Now, one of the things that I missed in last chapter, and I want to talk about it now, in that conveyance of agency, it creates agency with me. And we have been talking about this. There are many different levels of agency. The first level I want to talk about is called a universal agent. A universal agent, often you guys might also hear it called this. Power of attorney. Power of attorney. A universal agent can do anything that person can do except vote. They can enter into contracts, they can do banking, they may pay bills, they may sign uh, listing agreements. So for example, I'm a power of attorney for my mother. I can sign my mother's name on any document that she can sign. Under the law, I have been granted the power of attorney and now I am her universal agent. All right. Underneath universal agent. Yeah, I just lost my mind. What's it called? Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> I lost my mind there for a minute. General agent. A good example for a general agent is a property manager. If you remember several classes ago, I told you that real estate is very common in having this big item and then all of these items underneath it that are smaller. Remember we talked about the general warranty deed, special warranty deed, bargain and sale deed, same concept here. Universal agent can do everything that person can do in all areas of their life. Below them is a general agent, or yeah, universal, general. They can do many different things in only one area of a person's life, like a property manager. A property manager can enter into a lawn care contract. He might pay the bills. He might screen the tenants, collect the rent, only for that one property, right? Thumbs up. That would be an example of a property manager. The next agent is called a special agent. 
The best example for this is a realtor. All right. This, my friends, is the agency that gets conferred to me as the listing agent. I have said this before. As the listing agent, what is my job? One thing in one area. All I do is market the property for sale. I cannot hire a lawn care to mow the lawn. I cannot collect the rent from the tenant that's in that house. So we have universal, a lot of things in a lot of areas. General, a lot of things in one area. And then special, one thing in one area. Power of attorney, a property manager, and then a realtor. My job is to do one thing, list the property for sale. Or help the buyer buy a property. So depending on which side, but it's only one item. I don't enter into contracts for them. I don't mow their lawn. I don't collect their money. I don't pay their bills. Now, there's one other one I want to talk about. Is this agent. A designated agent is an agent that has been designated by one of these other people to help them in their quest in their agency. Guess who an example of a designated agent would be? Office you. manager? You. You have been designated to represent me in your mother's listing. Right? I kind of led into it earlier. I was setting you up for the punch. I was giving you the left hook. I told you, you come in and say, hey, I've got a new client. It's my mom. No, you don't. I have a new client. And I will designate you to represent me in this deal. I am the special agent, and that special agency is conferred or given to me in the listing agreement on page 172 that we're talking about, where we talk about my authority. Respect my authority. I have special agency. And I am going to get designated to you to let you help me do this. And for that, we are going to split the commission that I am charging the seller to list their property. On page 172 is that commission. Do we need to do more commission math? Are you guys pretty good with it? Pretty straightforward. I find that most agents learn this math first because this is the one that tells you what you're getting paid. Everybody knows how to do this one pretty damn quick. All right. Over on page 173, there's a section in the listing agreement that talks about personal property. Remember, two, we talked about. Uh, annexing and severing, you want to leave uh, the washer and dryer, so we're going to annex it into the real property. Your seller may tell you that we're going to do this. You need to capture that on the listing agreement. Your seller says, hey, man, I don't want to lug the pool table out of the basement, so we're going to leave that. <coughs> okay, I'm going to write it in the listing agreement. They also say, oh, but we want to take the chandelier in the entry foyer. Oh, that would technically stay, but you want to sever it? Okay, I'll write that in the listing agreement, that the chandelier in the foyer goes with the seller. So there is a section on the listing agreement 
where you would capture all the stuff that stays and all the stuff that goes. Because you need to translate that into that MLS system so that when a buyer sees it, they know, hey, the washer and dryer are staying at this house. Or that huge crystal chandelier in the front is going to be gone. So all of this would get captured so that you can translate it to the listing so that the other side of the table knows it. You would also put any leased equipment in here so that the new buyer knows they've either got to renew the lease or it's going to be gone. Good example would be a water softener that gets leased. For us old people, uh, Dish TV used to lease their dishes. All right, so uh, you would, uh, for Dish TV, not like they're eating dishes. All right. Um, I love in here where they say the proposed date for closing. No. If you could guess the proposed date of closing on the listing, you would be the best agent in the world and you would get every listing there is. There is no way. Hell, it may not even close. It could be a bad house. So we talk about the closing date on the purchase agreement, but certainly not on the listing agreement. There's no way for us to know this, all right? They do talk about the closing, meaning is it going to be a general warranty deed? And that the evidence of ownership is the seller. This is where he's going to declare, yes, I will give that general warranty deed to make the buyer happy. They're going to list any of those encumbrances because we need to translate to the new client that there is a shared driveway, there is a power line easement. The new buyer needs to know this. If there's a home warranty program going to happen, not a big fan. On the next page, you're going to have the date that the listing agreement expires, because remember, we cannot have perpetual listings. Inside of that paragraph is also the broker protection clause. Any of the warranties by the seller that may get transferred from like the new stove, that could be in there. The next section is another really cool word that I love to say, the indemnification clause. The indemnification clause is also called the hold harmless. And what the whole harmless clause says is this. I, as the agent, am not liable for any myths, myths, truths told to me by my client. If my client says the roof is brand new and I write the roof is brand new, and then you come and have a home inspection and find out there's th 13 shingles or 13 layers. You can't come to me and go, you're a liar. No. I told you what I was told. I'm not required to know the actual truth. We do not, we do not work under imputed knowledge. I'm sorry, I'm a little distracted. Ross keeps popping in and out. Ross, are you there? All right, my system keeps saying that you, you've left, you've arrived. You've left, you've arrived. Sound like a damn yo-yo over there. Up, down, up, down, up, down. All right. As long as you're cool, Ross, we're good, all right? The non-discrimination wording, obviously, this is the fair housing section that tells the client that they can't violate any of the seven protected classes. Uh, and if they do, you need to terminate and breach this contract because if they get caught, so do you. 
And if they get caught, that means they were practicing wrong and you shouldn't have let them be doing that to begin with. Okay? The anti-word trust, antitrust wording, remember back a couple courses ago when we talked about the Sherman Antitrust Act? There's a clause in our listing agreement that says that we are not colluding with other brokers to try and run your price up or price gouge or run somebody else out of business. Then you get the signatures of all the parties. Both the buyer and the seller, and it, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> misspoke. Both the husband and the wife who are the seller or business partners or just one but it needs to have all of the signatures. If there's a trust, this is becoming more and more common, where the trust becomes the signature, you would want to make sure that you have documentation saying that whoever is signing the paperwork for the trust actually has the right to sign the paperwork for the trust, all right? We had this happen just recently where we sold a property and the guy showed the document, we closed all of it. About a week later, I got a call from Florida where the lady is like, why did you sell my house? She was a little more animated than I just was. And I'm like, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. And she went on to explain that she was the owner of the house. So I looked it up and I'm like, says here it was the blah, blah, blah trust. And she said, well, yeah, yeah, the trust owns it, but I'm one of the members. I'm like, mm, are you the trustee? She said, well, no, my brother is. I said, okay, he's the one that signed. She's like, well, he didn't give me my share of the money. I'm like, well, you're above my pay grade now. All I know is the trust who owns the property submitted the documents saying that Bob was the trustee the title company and their attorney verified it. If Bob and you are having arguments, that's between you and he, all right? So make sure if the trust is the owner, you have the right documents for the person showing that they have the power, all right? Now, on the buyer side, we've talked a little bit about this already. <clears throat> They've got those three agreements. They're on page 175. They've got the exclusive buyer's agency, the exclusive agency buyer's agency, and then there is an open. On page 176 is a sample. Who cares? And then on page 180 are the six things that terminate buyer's agency. And I told you there's only six instead of seven because of... Destruction of the property is obviously not one of the items on the buyer's agency. All right. It seems like to me that I am going very quickly, very quick. Either I'm really good or you guys are, or both. Are you guys okay with chapter 10? So what we've talked about is the brokerage as a company. We talked about the agency as a concept, and now we've covered how we actually create that agency. All right, today's Wednesday. Here's what we're going to do. Tomorrow, or the next class, oh, hold on a second. I'm going to end the recording because the recordings don't need to know this. Any questions on Chapter 10? Thumbs up? All right, we're done with Chapter 10.